Hello, my name is Pearl McCaney. Welcome or welcome back to Revival Lost Southern Voices, a festival for readers. Being presented virtually this year in partnership with the Georgia Center for the Book and Georgia State University Perimeter College. We acknowledge also Georgia Humanities, which from the beginning has offered support and encouragement for the festival. One day during the Decatur Book Festival, Andy Rogers and I met among the book booths and the food wagons and began imagining how we might create an opportunity to share some of the Southern authors of the past. Revival Lost Southern Voices was born then in 2017 with the help of Greg Murray, Allison Law, and many others. Jen Kolotosti, Joe Davich, Gina Flowers, Carrie Miller, and Ali Stonewright soon joined the team and worked with the Decatur Book Festival, the DeKalb County Public Library, Emory University, Georgia Center for the Book, GSU's Kenneth M. England Professorship of Southern Literature, and Perimeter Honors Program to make the festival a reality. From the beginning, we considered the literal and figurative meanings of lost, of Southern, and of voices. The voices might be those of writers, artists, musicians of any genre. Southern is also a loosely applied modifier for a voice who is born in, traveled through, lived in the South, or whose work is about the South. South, of course, a geographic concept, is also protean, ever-changing, and lost, the festival seeks to revive the work that may be out of print or out of production, unread or underappreciated, or of renewed significance in our time, as with the writings of Lillian Smith and James Baldwin. The work may be lost because its artist is deceased or no longer writing or producing. To paraphrase P.L. Travers of Mary Poppins' renown, that which is lost is waiting to be found. Our presenters have been Natasha Sethaway, Lisa Omanyaka, Tony Bloom, and the late Terry Kay. Among the returning to present the Lost Southern Voices this year are Valerie Boyd, Brenda Bynum, Matt Dissinger. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the director of the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, and Georgia State University Perimeter College, welcome to our final session of Lost Southern Voices 2021. Just a few notes before we begin our program. Um, we are still doing our raffles. So if you sign up and you are in this session right now, we of course will contact you next week to let you know if you've won. We have a per session raffle, and then we have a raffle for the end of the entire festival. So for this particular session, we will be raffling off two copies of Love and Trouble by Alice Walker. And then everyone who has attended sessions throughout the festival will be entered into a raffle for a gift card for the restaurant also called Revival in downtown Decatur. We'd also like to remind you that once we finish the formal presentations, if you would like to ask any of our panelists questions, please feel free to type them either into the Q&A feature that you will find either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device or you can type them into the chat along the side of your screen. You'll also notice in the chat, we have placed um, digital copies of the program as well as the small flyer for the event today that just features our presenters and the bios of the lost voices that we'll be talking about. Right now, I would like to kick off the event by introducing our moderator for the afternoon, Jessica Handler. She is the author of the novel, The Magnetic Girl, which was the winner of the 2020 Southern Book Prize and a nominee for the Townsend Prize for Fiction. The novel is one of the 2019 books all Georgians should read and an Indie Next pick, a Wall Street Journal Spring 2019 pick, Bitter Southerners Summer 2019 pick, and a Southern Independent Booksellers Association Okra pick. Needless to say, the book has done quite well for Jessica without being named to the books all Georgians should read list. Her memoir, Invisible, Invisible Sisters, was also named one of the books all Georgians should read. And her craft guide, Braving the Fire, a guide to writing about grief and loss, was praised by Vanity Fair. Her writing has appeared on NPR, in Tin House, Drunken Boat, The Bitter Southerner, Electric Literature, Brevity, Creative Nonfiction, Newsweek, The Washington Post, and Atlanta Magazine. She teaches creative writing and coordinates the minor in writing at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta, 
and lectures internationally on writing. We are so very, very pleased to welcome Jessica Handler this afternoon. Jessica? Joe, thank you. And thank you, Allie and Pearl. And I'm delighted to be back with Lost Southern Voices. And I'm delighted to introduce today our three panelists. I'll introduce all of our, all three of the panelists, and then we'll uh, talk in order and I'll come back and uh, introduce them as we carry on. Our first speaker today is James Stamet. James is a visiting assistant professor at Agnes College in Decatur, Georgia. His interests include modernism, media, Southern literature, political violence, and fraud. He is the current president of the Elizabeth Maddox Roberts Society and past president of the Robert Penn Warren Circle. James's articles have appeared in the F. Scott Fitzgerald Review, South Central Review, and elsewhere, and his essays on Elizabeth Maddox Roberts have appeared in collections of scholarly work on Roberts and her texts. James's book, Competing Stories, Modernist Authors, Newspapers, and the Movies, 2019, is an examination of the complex relationship between modernist authorship and the mass media in the first part of the 20th century. His interest in media extends to book history, and since 2009, he's been an instructor of typecasting and typography at the Book History Workshop at Texas A&M University. Our second speaker will be Valerie Boyd. Valerie is a professor of journalism and narrative nonfiction writing and the Charlene Hunter Galt Distinguished Writer in Residence at the University of Georgia, where she founded and directs the Low Residency MFA program in narrative nonfiction. She is author of the critically acclaimed Wrapped in Rainbows, The Life of Zora Neale Hurston, which was hailed by Alice Walker as magnificent and extraordinary, by the Boston Globe as elegant and exhilarating, and by the Denver Post as a rich, rich read. Formerly arts editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Boyd has written articles, essays, and reviews for The Washington Post, The Los Angeles Times, Bon Appetit, Creative Nonfiction, The Oxford American, Essence, and Atlanta Magazine, among others. Boyd has spent the past several years curating and editing a collection of the personal journals of Pulitzer Prize winning author Alice Walker. Gathering Blossoms Under Fire, the journals of Alice Walker will be published by Simon and Schuster in 2022. And thirdly, Christopher Merkner. Christopher Merkner is the author of the story collection, The Rise and Fall of the Scand American Domestic. His publisher, Coffee House Press, calls Merkner a Shirley Jackson for the contemporary Midwest, where the ties of family and community intersect darkly with suburban American life. His work can be read on the Black Warrior Review, Cincinnati Review, Fairy Tale Review, the Gettysburg Review, New Orleans Review, and Best American Mystery Stories. He earned his MFA from the University of Florida and his PhD from the University of Denver. He's an assistant professor of English at the University of Colorado, Denver. Thank you all so much. Let's begin with James. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you everyone who's associated with Connected to Lost Southern Voices. I'm so glad to be a part of this. Um, I wanted to last year and of course, you know, it was canceled. So I'm so glad to be here now. So I'm gonna talk about Elizabeth Maddox Roberts who is a Kentucky writer who worked mostly in the 1920s and 1930s. Before Roberts died, she published three collections of poetry, seven novels, and two collections of short stories, the bulk coming in a span of just under 20 years. Her output, like Roberts herself, was truly remarkable. She wrote almost exclusively about Kentucky, but she also wrote about that place in new ways as a modernist who was mostly unable to get away from her home because of ill health. Her voice was an important one and was well respected during this period, but it was not long before she started to become lost. How lost was she and how lost is she? These are questions I asked myself in anticipation of this talk as someone who first read Roberts roughly 15 years ago in a graduate class and then joined the Elizabeth Max Roberts Society. And as you heard, I'm current president. So if you're interested, uh, please get in contact with me. I'll put my email in the chat later. Uh, but even within our author society, this is, there's some disagreement as to just how lost Roberts remains, but it's safe to say that she is underappreciated. There's no scholarly biography of Roberts that readers or academics can turn to yet. There is one in the works to be published by the University of Kentucky Press, so we're waiting for that. As it stands, Robert's life still contains many blurry spots and some misinformation has remained in the public for quite a long time. Take for instance, Robert's birth, which seems a fair place to start. Roberts was born in 1881, though for a long time her birth was listed in several sources as 1886, partly because of her own doing. Roberts was born in Perryville, Kentucky, and her family moved to Springfield when she was still quite young. In 1900, Roberts gave college a try 
but her poor health made it too difficult for her to stay. She struggled with her health for most of her life and her time living with Hodgkin's, which she was diagnosed with in 1936, ended in 1941 when Roberts was just 60. Roberts accomplished a lot in the 40 years between her first attempt at college and her death. After teaching elementary school in Springfield and then living with her sister in Colorado, Roberts tried something even more courageous than teaching small children. Perhaps it's a very courageous thing to do. Roberts enrolled in the University of Chicago in 1917 when she was 36 years old. Really a new life began for Roberts in Chicago and she seriously began her writing career. Roberts had already privately published one collection of poetry before her time in Chicago. And in 1922, she published a second collection of poetry with Viking Press titled Under the Tree. Robert Frost, in a January 1923 letter to Louis Untermeyer, said of this work, quote, we did have fun with under, under the Tree. Leslie had seen and liked it in manuscript in Chicago at Mrs. Moody's, highly poetical, end quote. His assessment speaks to her ability to write poetry, perhaps, but Roberts became much more known for her fiction. Like some other writers of the Southern Renaissance, Roberts came to fiction through poetry, and her ability to compose verse brings a particular life to her prose. The first hundred pages of The Time of Man, maybe Robert's best remembered work, serve as a good example. As in many of Robert's stories, The Time of Man is about a young woman struggling to survive in a difficult world, but appreciative to be alive. In this novel, that young woman is Ellen Chesser, and she travels through rural Kentucky with her family sharecropping. Here's a short passage from which the novel's title comes with a 15 year old Ellen working the land with her father and contemplating time. Quote, the rocks were dark with mold and moss for this was a virgin hill. It was a mild March day, cool and clear with winds worrying the hillside brush and leaping off across the farms in a great rush or beating gently now and then at Ellen's garments. Henry nailed at the frame while she worked with the stones. No plow iron ever cut here this here hill before not in the whole time of man, Henry said. The time of man, as a saying, fell over and over in Ellen's mind, end quote. Roberts published that novel in 1926, and it was met with critical acclaim. Soon after, Roberts became a prominent figure in American letters, taking her place amongst her modernist peers. Just one example of her statue, stature can be seen in her invited commentary on Ezra Pound's cantos in the 30s, not so much what she says about them, but the mere fact that she's part of a short list of authors who was asked to produce a testimonial of sorts. That list included the likes of Hemingway, Eliot, and Joyce. Roberts was only one of two women included in the publication, the other being HD. Roberts earned her position as a modernist and reading a novel like her 1928 Jingling in the Wind helps make that clear. While The Time of Man offers some stream of consciousness to the reader, Jingling in the Wind is more experimental. It's weird in a good way Roberts was incredibly versatile, and when readers think they have an idea of who she is as a writer, they need to think again and take another look. I've spoken about a number of different elements in Roberts' works over the years, and I've only scratched the surface. She had great interest in Greek and classical myths and stories, birds, and since my family put up four bird feeders during the pandemic this year, I've been very interested in birds, the Catholic community that resided near her home in Springfield, and just much, much more. She wrote about neurodiversity, a good example being her short story, The Scarecrow, a story that my students really responded to last fall in the Southern Women Writers course. That story is focused on a one young woman named Joan whose family defines her as Tetchis because she can't stand to be touched, even to have a comb run through her hair. The 1930s didn't have the language to classify Joan. Today, she might be discussed as being on the autism spectrum, but Robert's creation of Joan shows her belief in trying to understand the world around her, even when the words to define the, that world were far from being found. Roberts herself was a bit of an outsider in Springfield, and that may have led her to write about other individuals who were queer in one way or another in that part of Kentucky that Roberts called home. Roberts' biographer has suggested, who's still working on the biography, that uh, as such to members of the society, and it seems possible that she maintained a long relationship with a woman who worked as a journalist in Louisville. Certainly though, many of Roberts' characters often exist in liminal spaces, living on the margins and Roberts crafts these characters with care, imbuing them with humanity. In considering her subjects of, of many of her texts, generally, place is still the most prevalent focus in her works. Ellen Chesser, the protagonist of The Time of Man, almost grows into the earth around her as she works with her mother and father on various farms in Kentucky. And with that deep tie to place in mind and thinking of the title of our panel, I like to now narrow my focus a little bit and briefly talk about Roberts and place by addressing Roberts' connection to the South through the Civil War 
though not a war fought in the 20th century, certainly a war that was being reckoned with in the 20th century and in some ways still needs to be reckoned with. Roberts had a familial connection to the Civil War and her birthplace of Perryville was the site of the bloodiest battle fought in the Western Campaign and one of the bloodiest battles of the entire conflict. The battle occurred in 1862 and though Confederate General Braxton Bragg's Army of Mississippi scored an early tactical victory, the Union Army won the day and Kentucky. The state would remain under Union control for the rest of the war. Robert's father served and fought in the Confederate Army, signing up at 16 after the witness, witnessing the death of his own father at the hands of the National Guard for refusing to join the Union cause. Robert's other grandfather on Elizabeth's mother's side fought for the Union. Still, strangely, perhaps many of mentions of the Civil War are few and far between in Robert's literary work. There are really only two. References appear in Robert's novel, A Buried Treasure, and in her story, Record at Oak Hill. These two works of fiction appeared in close proximity to one another in the early years of the Great Depression. Both of Robert's references to the Civil War then are tied up in economic issues and anxieties which permeate the two stories, though in slightly, slightly different ways. Financial worries drive about half of a buried treasure, the half which tells the story of Philly and Andy Blair finding a literal pot of gold under a stump on their property and struggling to decide what to do with the money which has ostensibly changed their lives, the lives of this middle-aged married childless couple who can now put a new roof on both their house and the hen house. But I wanna focus on record at Oak Hill where readers find an old Kentucky family struggling to survive on their farm without clear and discernible places to point the finger of blame for their financial challenges. In this story, anxieties from the present mixed with financial troubles from the time surrounding the Civil War and both ambiguity and complexity are constants. Angela Green has written of record, quote, reconstruction era politics become conflated with those of the depression period in which the story is set, end quote. By the time that record was written, the United States had faced many financial crises. And as I read about banks closing in small towns across the country, which I read just yesterday, I was reminded how this element reaches forward to connect contemporary readers with the past. In the story, readers are reminded of how war can devastate an economy, but what is interesting about record is that it is a war story that doesn't discuss the conflict on the battlefields. There's almost no discussion about the fighting in record. The closest readers get is a mention of Stephen Burbridge and Ulysses S. Grant. Record does contain a partial story about Tom Laughlin and a man named Horace who had fought in what the narrator calls the old war on the first page of the story but the wounds that are examined are ones that are suffered outside of the official fighting. Tom's son, Horace, had been forced to flee after the war's conclusion, and record is focused on the killing of the man responsible for the harassment of Horace, a man named Buckman who, quote, didn't go to the war and was guilty of a hundred crimes, end quote, according to Tom's daughter, daughter, Morna. Robert's focus is on the ways in which no one can truly escape the war's far-reaching effects. Buckman never fights in any of the battles, but somehow still manages to bring the war back to the Laughlins, disallowing Horace a place to return to, pushing Tom to kill, but outside of the battlefield, and leaving his daughter, Morna, with the worry over that death that she still doesn't seem able to shake 65 years later. Morna describes her father, Tom, as a, quote, man of peace. He wouldn't fight unless he must, end quote. But fighting and chaos seem inescapable in the story, and the knife that Tom used to kill Buckman and was later hidden in plaster on the Laughlin place is discovered by Morna's great nephew, Richard Dorsey. The past then lingers hidden just beneath the surface, revealing the darkness of humanity and events that are only tangential to the war. As we are well aware, lostness was attached to the Civil War by advocates of the Confederacy quite soon after the South's defeat. Instead of proselytizing for the lost cause though, thankfully, Robert's brief fictional treatment of the war highlights the awfulness of war and both its wide and long reaching effects whether one is looking for a fight or is more peaceable. It demonstrates how the violence of war touches families in their homes. Morna says, quote, war never settles anything. The battles are fought after the war is over, end quote. Divisions remain after conflicts are fought, yet Robert's text points to a recognition of our connectedness and of our own capacity for violence, which might alter our thoughts about future conflicts or at least how we are connected to them. As Matt Nichol has written about record, quote, Roberts creates a complex narrative through a sense of betrayal and complicity, end quote. Ultimately, Robert's story connects readers to larger ideas about war and its effects and use effects and uses the events that occurred in during the war, as she says, to show how more than just enlisted soldiers continued to be touched by those, those events and had to endure war. 
I think that it was probably quite painful for Roberts to meditate on the old war, but that in her brief textual interaction, she was searching for ways to find the universal and the local to communicate something about her own place in Kentucky that could resonate more widely. To do that, she had to reckon with her home, but she also needed to find a way to communicate the vision of that place in her head to people who did not know the dark and bloody ground, people like me who were reading her in New York. She was always trying, as she once wrote in her journals, which are housed in the Library of Congress, to connect the quote, world of the mind and the outer order, end quote. In that sense, we get a cerebral meditation on not just the war between the states, but war more largely, something that still resonates for readers in 2021 when we consider the 10-year anniversary just passed of the Syrian civil war or the war in Afghanistan, which is closer to 20. I realize that is a really quick look at one of Robert's stories, and I could say more about it or about a buried treasure in which the imagined soldiers who buried the literal treasure are never able to return to retrieve it since the Blairs dig it up in the 20th century. But I wanted to end by returning to my original question about how lost Roberts is. Over the 80 years since her death and the anniversary of her passing was just on March 13th, there have been a number of attempts to reclaim Roberts and return her work to prominence. Decades before the Elizabeth Maddox Roberts Society was formed, Roberts advocates were wrote, writing about the greatness they saw in her work. One of these champions was Robert's fellow Kentucky writer, Robert Penn Warren, whose 1963 Saturday, Saturday Review essay serves as a foreword to the University of Kentucky edition of The Time of Man. Warren didn't, however, include Robert's work in his joint venture, American Literature, The Makers in the Making, roughly 10 years later. Similarly, when Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gabar edited the Norton Anthology of Literature by Women, The Tradition in English in the mid-1980s, they left her out too. Both of these texts opt for Ellen Glasgow over Roberts. Still, Roberts is sometimes nearby, just on the edges of our view. On a few personal notes, um, I found an Agnes Scott College binder in our building on campus a few years ago that dates to the late 1990s and contains material from a course on Southern literature. The binder has tabs for Carson McCullers, Alice Walker, Robert Penn Warren, and Eudora Welty. Roberts does not have a tab, but she is included in a document for the class that lists other Southern writers grouped by state. Also a few years ago, anecdotally, when my sister and I were clearing out our family home in New York, I came upon a little golden book titled My Christmas Treasury. This book published in 1979 contains Robert's poem titled Christmas Morning. So it's possible that I was actually introduced to Robert's when I was rather quite small. Uh, she was there just outside of my memories view. That said, Roberts has been more visible in the 21st century. The University of Kentucky edition of The Time of Man was published in 2000. In 2013, the independent publisher Hesperus reissued both The Time of Man and The Great Meadow, and Roberts' novel Flood was posthumously published in that same year. There are many current academic articles and a desperately needed scholarly biography, hopefully just around the corner. Maybe then, like Daniel Boone, who Roberts borrows from in her novel The Great Meadow, Roberts hasn't ever been truly lost even if readers have been a might bewildered for a few days. Certainly though, even if she isn't lost, her work remains very underappreciated. Thank you. James, thank you for that appreciation. Um, as we listen to our speakers, please uh, feel free to put questions in the Q&A box and we'll go to questions at the end. Our next speaker is Valerie Boyd. Let's welcome Valerie. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's really great to be here uh, virtually. I've done the Lost Southern Voices Festival in person a couple of times and I, I miss it. So it's great to be here virtually together. Um, I am um, here to talk a little bit about Alice Walker. And um, Alice Walker is a quite well-known writer who's from Eatonton, Georgia. And uh, we know her mostly as a novelist. So it's, it's difficult to say that she is a lost Southern voice, but I'd like to talk a bit about her as a short story writer. Um, because she is so well known for her work as a novelist, particularly her Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Color Purple, we often forget about her work as a short story writer. And I wanna focus on that today. Um, Walker's very first book, Once, was a collection of poetry published in 1968. But even before that, she was busy teaching herself how to write the short story. Her mastery of the short story was hard won and deliberate. Uh, very early in her career as a writer, she took an interest in the short story 
and pushed herself to study the form deeply. Um, as Jessica mentioned in the introduction, I've been working for the past six years or so on editing and curating Alice Walker's journals. Uh, Alice started keeping journals when she was 18. She's now 77. So we have more than 50 years of her journals that are um, housed at uh, Emory University's uh, Rose Library. And I've had the great good fortune of reading those journals and being able to uh, curate a collection. That book, Gathering Blossoms Under Fire, the journals of Alice Walker will be published in um, spring of 2022. So this time next year, hopefully we will be celebrating that, uh, the release of that book in, in person. Um, but today I wanna share with you a couple of the journal entries from um, that forthcoming book uh, that show Alice Walker's early influences as a short story writer and that show her commitment to mastering the form. So um, on June 3rd, 1966, when Alice Walker was 22 years old, she wrote this in her journals. I should probably become better acquainted with the potential of the short story. Right now, I would like to do a story in the fashion of Ambrose Bierce. He is very much like Poe to me, even more terrifying perhaps certainly more haunting than Ray Bradbury, whose stories I must also reconsider. Then about a year and a half later, on December 19th, 1967, Alice Walker had just finished reading uh, Cain by Gene Toomer. Cain is a classic work of um, short stories that are sometimes really minimalist. And if you're not familiar with Cain by Gene Toomer, I, I highly urge you to, to take a look at it. It's a very slim book of short stories and other prose that I can't even call a short story. It's really a major um, influential work. And Alice Walker read it for the first time in 1967. And so on December 19th, 1967, she wrote in her journal, this work so underestimated, I am sure. I must find out how it was received when it first appeared. And it appeared in the 1920s, just to, to let you know. So she wrote, I must find out how it was received when it first appeared, how much influence it obviously had on Richard Wright, how free it is in its showing of the Southern loveliness. There is a freshness that is sadly missing in much of black writing today. Freshness, brevity, universality. What I really feel ready for is my book of short stories. Again, this is her writing in 1967. What I really feel ready for is my book of short stories. The novel confuses me if I'm honest. So it's interesting that Alice Walker, who is acclaimed as a great American novelist in 1967 before she had written a novel or a book of short stories was saying that she was ready for short stories and felt still confused by the novel. And so um, her first collection of short stories was published in 1973. It's a book called In Love and Trouble. And again, it was published in 1973, 10 years before she won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award for The Color Purple. Uh, she had written two novels uh, during those that 1970s period as well. She wrote um, The Third Life of Grange Copeland, which was her first uh, novel, and then her second novel was Meridian. Uh, both of those books were written in the 1970s alongside her collection of short stories um, in Love and Trouble. Her second short story collection, You Can't Keep a Good Woman Down, was published in 1981. And so uh, we find when we look at Alice Walker's short stories that she explored the same themes or similar themes in her short stories as she would later explore perhaps more fully in her novels. Some of those, those themes include the beauty and comfort of nature, childhood innocence thwarted, racism and inner freedom, and women becoming themselves. I also see in her uh, short stories, the same economy of language that we find in her novels. And in the short stories, because of the brevity of the form, I feel that her economy of language is sometimes breathtaking. And so I want to read a short story for you. 
uh, from that 1973 collection in Love and Trouble. And this short story is two pages long. It's very short. So this is an example of that economy of language. I wanna read this for you. And then um, I'll end my presentation there, but I would love to interact with the um, listeners and viewers with questions, any questions that you have. So this is a short story called The Flowers. It's written by Alice Walker in, in Love and Trouble, Stories of Black Women, which was first published in 1973, The Flowers. It seemed to Mayop as she skipped lightly from hen house to pig pen to smoke house that the days had never been as beautiful as these. The air held a keenness that made her nose twitch. The harvesting of the corn and cotton, peanuts and squash made each day a golden surprise that caused excited little tremors to run up her jaws. Mayop carried a short, knobby stick. She struck out at random at chickens she liked and worked out the beat of a song on the fence around the pig pen. She felt light and good in the warm sun. She was 10 and nothing existed for her but her song, the stick clutched in her dark brown hand and the tat de ta ta of accompaniment. Turning her back on the rusty boards of her family's sharecropper cabin, Mayop walked along the fence till it ran into the stream made by the spring. Around the spring where the family got drinking water, silver ferns and wildflowers grew. Along the shallow banks, pigs rooted. Mayop watched the tiny white bubbles disrupt the thin black scale of soil and the water that silently rose and slid away down the stream. She had explored the woods behind the house many times. Often in late autumn, her mother took her to gather nuts among the fallen leaves. Today, she made her own path, bouncing this way and that way, vaguely keeping an eye out for snakes. She found, in addition to various common but pretty ferns and leaves, an armful of strange blue flowers with velvety ridges and a sweet suds bush full of the brown fragrant buds. By 12 o'clock, her arms laden with sprigs of her findings, she was a mile or more from home. She had often been as far before, but the strangeness of the land made it not as pleasant as her usual haunts. It seemed gloomy in the little cove in which she found herself. The air was damp, the silence close and deep. Mayop began to circle back to the house, back to the peacefulness of the morning. It was then she stepped smack into his eyes. Her heel became lodged in the broken ridge between, between brow and nose. And she re reached down quickly, unafraid to free herself. It was only when she saw his naked grin that she gave a little yelp of surprise. He had been a tall man. From feet to neck covered a long space. His head lay beside him. When she pushed back the leaves and layers of earth and debris, Myop saw that he'd had large white teeth, all of them cracked or broken long fingers and very big bones. All his clothes had rotted away, except some threads of blue denim from his overalls. The buckles of the overalls had turned green. Mayap gazed around the spot with interest. Very near where she stepped into the head was a wild pink rose. As she picked it to add to her bundle, she noticed a raised mound, a ring around the rose's root. It was the rotted remains of a noose, a bit of shredding plow line, now blending benignly into the soil. Around an overhanging limb of a great spreading oak clung another piece, frayed, rotted, bleached, 
and frazzled, barely there, but spinning restlessly in the breeze. My up laid down her flowers and the summer was over. Val, thank you. It's very hard to speak after that story and I've read it before and it's the genius in that work. Um, yes, please put questions in the Q&A and we will pick those up as we uh, complete our day. Our last speaker is Christopher Merkner. Let's welcome Christopher. Hi, and um, yeah, thank you, Valerie. It's a great story. Um, I feel strange that it's the, the first time I read this story was just last year. And it was, um, I'm not sure how, I guess it's to your point. Yeah, it actually is why I haven't seen that story until last year, but it's a, it is indeed. When you said she's a master of the form, it's a phrase that I, I think about a lot, the master of the form of the short story. But then you read that story and uh, I think you're right. Um, so thank you for that. So um, yeah, the, uh, I said that I'm in my, I'm in outer space here, but actually I'm just in my basement, uh, which is unfinished uh, and uh, kind of the dump, sort of a second garage really in our house. And so we, uh, I use the filter to protect you uh, from what you might see back there. Uh, and as I was coming downstairs to, to do this uh, today, my wife said, expressed some concern uh, because she knows, first of all, I don't uh, do this sort of thing well. <laughs> uh, it's not really that funny. And then uh, additionally, uh, you know, she said, I just I worry that you, you maybe didn't prepare as well as you might have. And I, I did prepare, uh, first of all. Uh, but uh, secondly, um, I also thought uh, to say that um, it really can't be a whole lot worse, uh, whatever happens here, uh, couldn't be a whole lot worse than having a, a, a white white man uh, presenting on uh, a white male author who writes almost exclusively about white males at a conference in Georgia uh, right now. So, uh, both funny and not funny. Um, so there's an implicit uh, acknowledged apology. Um, when asked uh, for a list of the best American writers of the younger generation, I invariably put the name of Paget Powell at the top. That's by Saul Bellow said that. Uh, Paget Powell has an almost unequaled ability to bring Southern colloquial speech to the page. That was Amy Hempel. The Washington Post Book World wrote that Powell's stories, Paget Powell's stories are glee, gleefully non-narrative, aggressively stylized, linguistically inventive, and often very funny. Language drunk, disorienting, Dazzling turns of phrase, wonderful tapestry from wonderful tapestries from ordinary speech, fireworks of language. These are really uh, just a few of the many ways that Paget Powell's short fiction has been described over the last thirty years or so. Um, I did not know any of this uh, when I was in my early twenties uh, and living in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. Um, I was not then reading Paget Powell's fiction. I had never heard of Paget Powell, did not know about Paget Powell's work, uh, nor had I read any Barry Hanna, nor Mary uh, Robeson. Um, I really wasn't reading much of anything, uh, if I'm being honest, in those years, uh, back about 20 some years ago now. Um, I was writing stories uh, for friends around campfires uh, in the mountains, as I say, uh, in Washington State. Uh, stories about uh, pikas and marmots and animals. And uh, when somebody told me that I might consider doing something more with my life uh, in the mountains than be in the mountains, uh, they suggested perhaps I try a degree, a graduate degree in creative writing, which I didn't necessarily know even really existed. 
uh, and uh, took me a few days to get out of the mountains, but I went down to Wenatchee to the public library uh, where I was able to thumb through a book on graduate programs in creative writing and somewhat randomly uh, sent a, an application to the University of Florida uh, because uh, they did not require uh, the, the ability to speak a second language. Uh, and their description also, as I recall it now, was pretty strange, uh, for, you know, description of their program. And so I went with it and it sounded okay. So I, I sent out you know, service mail in the, in the back in that day and an envelope with whatever they asked me to send to them. Uh, when a couple uh, months later, uh, I was collecting my mail at a sort of bed and breakfast uh, every few months or so. And so when I went to collect my mail, uh, the letter from the University of Florida was there. Uh, along with two other letters. Uh, one was uh, from a seminary, which is a whole different story. Uh, and another one from a different graduate program that I also applied to. Um, I did uh, three applications and they, they rejected me. But the University of Florida letter was there. The University of Florida is the university with the graduate program where Padre Powell, of course, um, teaches. I say, of course, just because I think it's implied, not that you should necessarily know that. Um, but the, the University of Florida acceptance uh, was a short letter and it gave me a phone number. I didn't have a phone at the time. We weren't doing cell phones then. Um, I would uh, first call William Logan, who at the time was the director of the program uh, from a pay phone at a truck stop in Oregon. Uh, and he uh, complained about the noise uh, behind me and, and joked, where are you at a truck stop? And, and you know, I was, of course, at the truck stop. Uh, and he was annoyed uh, and he got him to get off the phone uh, with me very quickly. And uh, he just said, here, I'll give you Paget's number. <laughs> and so um, he gave me Paget's number, but I, was, I didn't have the nerve at the time to call Paget uh, at that point. I was about as nervous uh, then as I am now, uh, let's just say uneasy. Uh, but at any rate, a couple months later or a couple weeks later, I, I, uh, I did call Paget from that same uh, bed and breakfast back in Washington state. And uh, the two things I remember Paget telling me at that time uh, well, one, that uh, it was hot in Gainesville and I should be ready if I were to come for it to be hot. And secondly, that I was his guy and that I had to come because I was his guy. And, um, you know, at the time I didn't um, know anything about Paget, what he wrote about or how he wrote or <laughs> uh, really nothing. So I should have probably been a little bit more concerned. <laughs> about that phrasing, but I, uh, I, I was alone in the mountains there for so many years, it sounded good to be someone's guy. So I, 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 I did it and I, I went to the University of Florida to work uh, there. Um, so that is to say that I didn't go to the University of Florida as an acolyte of Paget Powell and Paget had then, I learned and as he has now many acolytes uh, but I wasn't an acolyte of Paget Powell's really. I uh, wasn't an acolyte of Paget Powell's southernness, uh, nor his fiction, um, nor his, uh, quote, light someone's ass on fire and spank it out type of sentences. I believe that's a quote from one of his novels. I came to the University of Florida's MFA program as an acolyte of Powell's kindness. The title story to his most recent collection of short stories, A Cries for Help, various, uh, the title story of that ends this way. Man, period. Locating sucker is getting hard. Sucker, S-U-C-C-O-R. Uh, for me, what has always drawn me to Paget Powell is what I think is frequently lost about Paget Powell and that he is in fact uh, really quite a uh, quite kind person and he likes to help. He doesn't have patience uh, with falseness and fake gestures. He is genuinely a decent person, I think, who trusts, excuse me, who mistrusts quote unquote decency and gestures toward genuineness. Uh, one quick anecdote, just I do remember in his workshop, uh, when I, one of the workshops that I was in with him was during the I believe it would have been the 2000 election had to be. And I think it was just after Al Gore won the Democratic nomination. And uh, he and Tipper were on stage on television uh, kissing. I think he, they had a sort of relatively notorious and unfortunate kiss. And I remember him acknowledging that that kiss for him was enough to now know he could not vote for Al Gore. <laughs> um, <laughs> so at any rate, maybe you'll 
find that on YouTube and perhaps reflect on, on how he sees genuineness and uh, sincerity and what that means. I, I do want to say before I move to the second set, which, uh, section, which is I'm going to read a section of a short story of Paget's from his first collection of stories back in uh, about 1981. And then I will read, or excuse me, 1991. And then I will read uh, just a tiny little short excerpt from that recent collection that uh, about 2018 or so. But I want to just quickly say that, you know, I don't think that Paget would want me to romanticize him uh, or idealize him. And I, I, I suspect the people who work with him regularly would, would feel the same way. Um, but I just, you know, I, I still, my experience with him has been one of uh, great kindness and not necessarily the persona I think that he carries with him as I understand it. So now I'll read uh, two little excerpts and I'll say a little bit about that at the end before I close. Candace Bergen, uh, this story is, is an excerpt from the middle of a short story. Candace Bergen is my pick for the most good to look at and probably kiss and maybe all you could do woman in the world. All fools have their whims. Should an ordinary daily kind of regular person carry around desires like this? Why do people do this? Of course, a lot of money is made on fools with pinups in the backs of their head. But why do we continue to buy? We'd be better off with movie stars that look like the girls from high school that had to have sex to get any tension at all. You put Juicy Lucy Spoons on the silver screen and everybody'd be happy to go home to his faithful, hopeful wife. I don't know what they do in Russia on film, but if the street women are any clue, they're on to a way of reducing foolish desire. They look like good soup makers and no head problems, but they look like potatoes. I'm sorry. They've done something over there that prevents a common man from wanting the women of Beaumont. There are many mysteries in this world. I should be a better person. I know I should, but I don't see that finally being up to choice. If it were, I would not stop at being a better person. Who would? The girls what couldn't get dates in high school, for example, are my kind of people now, but they, they, but then they weren't. I was like everybody else. I thought I was the first piece of sliced bread to come wrapped in plastic then. Who didn't? To me, it really, it is really comical how people come to realize they are really just a piece of shit, more or less. Not everybody's the candy man or a dog poisoner. I don't mean that, but a whole lot of folk who once thought otherwise of themselves come to see they're just not that hot. That is something to think on if you ask me, but you don't and you shouldn't, which it proves my point. I'm a fellow discovers he's nearly worth disappearing without a difference to anyone or anything. No one to be listened to, trying to say that not being worth being listened to is a discovery we make in our life and then immediately sort of ends the life and its feedback of self-serious and importance. That was from 1991. And that's from the story of typical. Uh, then this little snippet comes from uh, Cries for Help, Various, that's the actual story it's from too, the title story of that collection. The moment I touched the flyer, my life did change. I saw to the core of adult capitalist life, what constitutes the highest good, highest good is uppercase there. And then all of this is uppercase. It is the moment you induce others to give you a lot of money for something that did not cost you much to supply. This I now know is the only lasting thrill not meeting a woman or having good drugs or securing a good job or a car or seeing God or whatever. The thrill that the big boys are about now is duping for cash. <clears throat> Before my first book of stories came out in 2014, I wrote to Paget to request a blurb. I, he and I uh, had not stayed in touch. Um, this would have been about a decade uh, since I had left the program. Uh, we weren't staying in touch. I still don't stay in touch with Paget. Um, we have, we had no relationship then, and we don't don't now. Um, but I wrote him because um, I guess that is what one does. It is possible that uh, one of the attendees here today, Josh Russell, told me, who is a friend of mine, who told me to write uh, to write Paget. I don't know why I wrote Paget, but I did. He wrote back with this uh, with his address, 
Um, and he said he would look at it, but then he wrote, well, not, I mean, this is all he wrote. He said, he wrote, he, there was an address there. And then he wrote, you can send it, but sometimes I am without comment. And sometimes I issue blurbs that publishers who have solicited them reject. <clears throat> and then he did uh, write me back. Uh, so I think I, I'm sure I excessively thanked him <laughs> and then sent him the book. And then this is what uh, he, he did give a blurb and he wrote, um, here is a thing you may use if you can. And he writes, uh, Chris Merkner is the happiest, most disturbed, certainly the most happily disturbed writer that I know. And um, I don't know if I can see this here, but uh, it's right at the top. Oh, you can't see it. Well, he put it on the top of the book. It's, uh, he didn't put it there, but the press took this uh, idea of me being disturbed and, and put it at the top of the book uh, for me. And so I thanked him uh, when, I, you know, when he came out and I said, uh, you know, I chided him or tried to chide him a little bit about how my wife and my children um, and family, broadly speaking, weren't necessarily in love with the idea of me being announced as a disturbed person, uh, which was a ribbing that he did not uh, reply to, as you might imagine, maybe if you know Paget. But the more I thought about it, the more I decided that I actually liked it uh, because I don't think of myself, because I do think of myself as disturbed um, in the way that I think he may have intended it or not, but I do think it's okay. But um, the truth is I am disturbed. We live in a world that is disturbing. Uh, what matters, um, like the voting rights crisis that emerged yesterday in Georgia, one is inclined to think that the world is more disturbing now than ever before, and maybe that's true. But the point is, I think there's a way for me to be disturbed, to be a disturbed writer in the same way and in the same manner that Powell, who is uh, very much alive and very much active in the field and still very much revered and sought after, um, I think it's uh, possible that it, the same play on Lost might work here. Um, and if I'm disturbed, I think Paget could easily still be considered lost. Um, as I say, or as I said earlier, what I think we sometimes lose in Paget Powell, kept behind all the talk about his language and trickery and some of the ostentatious moments in the passages that I read, um, and his irreverence generally, uh, his uh, irreverence generally. Um, and so what was described by the New York Times at one point as his disdain for uh, middle, middle brow political correctness uh, is his inability to find his uh, way in the world, in this world, this utterly disingenuous and brutal world sometimes. And I do imagine that Padgett, Padgett Powell questions his whereabouts and probably has for many years felt quite lost. Interviews uh, with friends of his uh, that I saw in the you know, New York Times and, and have seen over the years seem to attest to that basic premise as well. There is a sense of being lost. And in case, I think there's a wonderful sense in Paget's short fiction uh, 30 years ago uh, and today that willfully cannot figure out where we are, uh, the American South um, in matters of race, in matters of masculinity, uh, in matters of um, socioeconomics, uh, in matters of just basic humanity. There's a sense of being lost. And I think that if there's anything about his language that I want to say as I close, it's simply that, at least for me, those pyrotechnics and the tricks of language in his stories aren't really some sort of uh, wizardry or, or, or uh, dispassionate engineering or some sort of parlor game. I get from Powell, and I, I have had this for as long as I've known him by, uh, by way of that phone call, um, uh, while shooting also television sets with him at his compound and with a group of people I wasn't invited privately, thank God, uh, or listening sh uh, to him lecture on, on chiropractic procedures in a fiction workshop or describing the machinations of a fiction workshop as a sort of chiropractic operation. What I get from Powell uh, is the sense that his language, in, in his language and his play with language, he sees um, language uh, as the, that is coherent or, or proper, as he might say it, or genteel or linear or clear uh, is the type of narrative or type of language that is associated with a world he rightly mistrusts, a world that has no real correspondence to succor uh, or kindness. Um, and if Paget Powell uh, is in fact lost, I think it's because these are the qualities that this country and humanity generally seems entirely at peace with losing. Not to be too bleak about it, I write, but I do, but I do think that so much of the world is lost to Powell, uh, and that he is to some degree lost in a world like this one, and that he's embracing being lost from this kind of world as being found is so often a process that he would find rather hateful, hurtful, mean, and certainly artificial and false. 
Um, I'm really glad that you invited me uh, to this conference as I'm not from the South. And I learned I'm also one of the few people not vaccinated, it turns out. Uh, my whole panel was talking about vaccinations earlier, clearly not one of them. Uh, but I just wanna say thank you uh, for helping you revive him for me as well as he isn't somebody who I study or, or, or work with closely and I don't know him well, but um, I'm just very grateful for um, your invitation. So thank you. Chris, thank you so much. Um, what I'd like to do again is thank all of you. I'm not gonna clap audibly because it you know, creates some kind of something on the audio, but I think we're gonna go to questions. And um, I have one here from Gina Flowers for James. And then I have a question. Tiffany had a question for Val that came in in the chat that I'm gonna ask and then a couple more. So bring them on. Um, but James, Gina Flowers asks, is there any further insight into why Ellen Glasgow seemed to edge out Roberts in the anthologies? And what would you say to future canon shapers to encourage them to include Roberts? Well, um, to the second part of that question, I would say to go read some Roberts. You know, I think if, if people would go back and read Roberts, um, she probably would find her way back into the canon. Uh, when, when Robert Penn Warren wrote this, this essay I alluded to, um, you know, from 1963, the Saturday Review, he was making a claim that you know the things that Roberts was writing about in the 30s weren't things that people that the audience really wanted to to read about at this time, and that it was more political that she that she had been kind of dropped out of the consciousness. I don't know if that's true in relation to to Glasgow. You know, I, I think it's it's still kind of puzzling to me. You know why this was. Um, you know, when I think about makers in the making. You know, there weren't many women in that at all right so there's so there's this idea that maybe you know they felt like well we've already got somebody you know who fits this category and, the, and they didn't even think about her but um but i think that certainly if people would go back you know people who are continuing then to to rethink and reshape the canon would go back and read uh, you know some of the, the scarecrow which you know i talked about briefly in my talk for example i think that they would see how worthy she is to be you know to be in classrooms and, and being read, um, you know, in discussion. Oh, I was muted. Thank you. Um, on the subject of anthologies, Val, uh, Tiffany asks um, if The Flowers is anthologized. I don't think it is anthologized, um, except for in, of course, Alice Walker's, uh, there's an anthology of her, it's, uh, it's called The Short Stories mm -hmm. Complete. So it's a collection of all of her short stories. So of course the flowers is included in that, but I don't think it is in any other uh, anthology. Okay, do you know why that might be? I don't, I don't, I mean, several of, some of her other stories have been uh, anthologized. Um, I think uh, the flowers is, as you heard, is, is devastating. Yeah. I mean, that last part of it is just one paragraph where she sort of exposes this uh, rude coming of age for Maya. And it's so economical. I mean, it's two pages, yeah. you know, but that last, uh, that, that last bit of it is quite devastating. And maybe that doesn't, you know, read well in anthologies. I don't know. I don't know. It's, you know, the 21st century term for what that would be is flash fiction. Yes. So I'm surprised it's not in a flash anthology. Right, right. Yeah. And given, um, you know, the uh, sort of racial reckoning that many of us are grappling with now, now might be a good time for it to be anthologized. Yeah. I love how ideas come out of these panels. Um, who has more questions? I've got some to, to keep us going here. Um, Chris, talking about Paget Powell, um, do you think interrogative mood is a particularly 21st century novel? Uh, well, before I answer that one, and I don't even know that I'm going to have a great answer for you, uh, Jessica, but... Um, I'm not great. Okay. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. I, this is how I live my life, uh, in fear of that exact, exact issue. Um, I just want to say that the, I mentioned that I had read uh, that story, uh, Valerie, and I, I did see it, it. I was teaching an introduction to literature course uh, and, and short fiction and poetry and drama. And actually it was in that anthology. And I'm looking around this nightmare that you can't see known as my basement. And that was because I was foolishly thinking I might be able to find that anthology in the midst of everything. 
I'm still looking over there as though it might appear. But at any rate, I did see it. It was anthologized and okay. um, it was just last year. But I know if, if you're interested, I can find it for you. But just anyway, there's a little footnote there. Um, is the interrogative mood a 20, 20th or 21st century? 21st, since we're talking about 21st century, you know, uh, in the panel. I mean, I'm, it was, go ahead, it came, when did it come out? I think it came out in the 21st century, but it, talking about the style in interrogative mood. Yes, I have to tell you that I'm not familiar with the novel. I mean, I know the novel you're referring to. I'm sorry yeah. that I don't know it. I was really. Isn't it written entirely in a, in, in a yeah. series of repeated questions? It is, yes. He asks yeah. in a question. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly correct. I mean, in that way, it feels a little bit more 20th century. Don't you think like late like 20th century than it does necessarily for 21st century? But um, but I, I confess that. And, and, yeah, and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. It's, um, I've. I don't teach it because honestly, I'm sort of afraid that um, college sophomores are going to try and do it. And I'm afraid of that. <laughs> um, so if there are college sophomores here, take me to task on it. Um, I have a question for somebody, for James. Hesperus reissued Roberts's work. He said, what is it that drove them to undertake that reissue? I do not know. Um, or what do you think, you know? Yeah, I mean, so this is a, a, a press in the UK and um, it's the, these, two, these two books. I, I would like to think that maybe the work that the Elizabeth Maggs Roberts Society has been doing for the last 20 years could have something to do with it. Certainly we do some proselytizing around, you know, for, for Roberts, you know, we, we believe that, that her work is good and, and that she should be reclaimed. Um, and and although some early kind of critics saw the Great Meadow maybe as her kind of central novel, the best you know work she had produced, certainly in more contemporary times, certainly since maybe the '80s and certainly in the 21st century, the Time of Man has been the book which seems to be the one for people to read. And so um, so that might be you know it might it could be a little bit our influence that that they um, decided to do to do that one along with the Great Meadow. But, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure why, you know, there must have, they must have felt that there was going to be an audience, you know, for it in the UK. Um, but I'm not sure. And yeah, and I was just curious, uh, because part of what we're talking about here is lost, not lost, you know, that kind of thing. Josh Russell put uh, in the comments, uh, nine, 2000. So if we were in person, I would call out to Josh in the audience and say, or I could also look it up on Dr. Google, but is that the pub date for interrogative mood? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, who's got more questions? I've got the Q&A open and I've got the chat open. Is anything the panelists would like to address that we didn't pick up or to each other? Let's see, I gotta come up with more questions. Let's see. Um, let's see, uh, Joe, Allie, you got any questions for us you wanna, you wanna bring into the group? Let's see, I'm fooling around with my chat here trying to get, oh, here we go. More chats are happening. Joe says he's getting a question ready. So he's working on that. Um, that's good, that's good. You know, one of the things that, that came up as we were talking and I'm looking at my, my tragic handwriting, which um, is so bad that my students have actually done interventions with me about my handwriting um, is, let's see. You know, Val, you were talking about how Alice Walker, one of her many themes is um, women becoming themselves as a theme. And I know that's true of Alice Walker because I've been reading her since I was 12 or something. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, Walker was reading, studying 19th and 20th century authors. You're talking about Bierce, you're talking about Poe, you're talking about Jean Toomer. So that's late 19th into the middle of the 20th century. Um, I think where I'm going with this is how does the idea of women and girls becoming themselves speak to 21st century readers and writers? Um, well, this gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about the uh, collection of uh, her journals that I've been Excellent. working on. Um, so as I mentioned, Alice Walker started keeping journals when she was 18. She just turned 77 in February. So she has a, a lifetime that she has chronicled in real time in her journals. And so that phrase, women becoming themselves, is 
part of what I see in her journals. It is the, uh, the, the, the chronicling of a woman becoming herself in real time. And so I feel that that book, the journals will be a real gift to everyone, people of all genders and all races and cultures, but especially a gift to women in terms of seeing the evolution of a free woman. And so what's beautiful about it is that it's not Alice Walker, you know, at 75, looking back on her 25 year old self. It's her at 25 actually writing in real time about what was going on with her, about wanting to teach herself the short story about, you know, when she was divorcing her husband, writing about trying to figure out if she could make $10,000 in that year. I believe it was 1972. If she could make $10,000 to support herself and her daughter. So you have her adding up figures and really trying to figure out if this is a viable um, act of self-determination that she can take. Of course, she didn't know then that she was going to become Alice Walker, yeah, iconic American novelist. She was just like, can I afford to make this move? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, um, that's what you see throughout the journals. And I feel that that, that that book is going to be that 21st century kind of primer for young people uh, becoming themselves. Like, I can't wait to give a copy to my 21 year old niece. Yeah. And, you know, um, like it, it's going to just sort of be that primer, I think, yeah. for how you become yourself and how you step into your greatness as a free human being. Yeah, good. Um, we've got some more questions coming in. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit to kind of even out who gets to speak about what. Joe um, had a question. I'm jumping between chat and uh, QA. Um, Joe wants to know if Josh was in the audience when Paget read at the uh, Decatur Library in 09. But Joe also asks, how should all of us re-examine the canon that we read in the schools and that we teach to expand it or rebuild it uh, to fit into how the world is today? So how do we re-examine the canon? Do you want to just kind of pick that up? Whoever wants to just take that ball and run with it? How do we re-examine the canon? What do we teach, not teach? How do we frame it? Anybody? Should I call on somebody? Go ahead, James. Well, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a difficult question um, because oh, yeah. depending on your circumstances and, you know, you might want different canon for whatever moment or context you're thinking about. For one thing, I, I mean, I think we should think about the canon as being more fluid, you know, obviously, you know, one of the problems with the canon is that when uh, it was quite rigid, you're leaving out voices and we have the opportunity to have, you know, I mean, not just to look at the Norton anthology and say, well, here's the canon, um, but something much larger than that. And, you know, I think, I think talking with students for me, it helps me to think about, um, you know, what works, speak to them, you know, works that I thought were maybe important. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I'm re-examining them through the eyes of my students and maybe works that they're kind of letting me know about. Um, right. But that, but that, yeah, I mean, just, just making sure that we're not thinking of it as this static kind of object and letting it be more fluid. Um, I think just re-examining it in itself is important, whether or not, you know, how we re-examine it, I'm not exactly sure. It might, it might depend, you know, on the case. Well, well let me interrupt because the, uh, Tiffany has a question that is a really interesting flip side of that, which is as a student, how do I go about discovering more lost Southern voices to create a more diverse narrative, which I read as parentheses changing the canon? So how, what would you say to Tiffany? Well, I mean, I think we need, I mean, for me at least, you know, the way that I think about this is, is I have certain people whether those are critics or friends or family or my wife, um, who I trust, I trust their judgment, uh, their aesthetics kind of, you know, are in line with mine or, you know, certain things. Josh is saying we should have a Lost Southern Voices anthology, which would be a good way to do this. Um, but so in that sense, you know, and, and for me, when I said that I came to Roberts 15 years ago in a graduate course, this is a professor who was a mentor of mine back in New York. And 
you know, I, I'm sure I wouldn't have ever heard of Elizabeth Max Roberts had it not been for him. So, you know, I, I'm, there's so much out there that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I have to recognize that, you know, and, and, and kind of deal and grasp with that and reckon with that. But um, when it comes to people like, you know, I trusted his taste in, in, liter in literature. And I think, you know, trying to find people who we trust, you know, their taste and, and asking them, do you know other Southern writers? Do you know other, you know, short stories of Alice Walker that I should be reading, you know, other than everyday use, what else should I be reading? Um, I think that's, that's one way. It's, yeah. it's hard because, you know, if it's lost, if it's really lost, you know, then you got to find the right person to help you, you know, bring, get it back. Other thoughts on that? I would just say that the, I agree with, with what James is saying about the canon has to be, it has to be flexible. It has to be um, um, morphable. It has to be ever evolving because if it's not, then we are saying that the literature of some people matters more than others. Right. Because the canon is still largely, you know, white and male and when white and male people control those academic um, resources more than they do even now, uh, they sort of formed a canon and that became it. But if we let that be static, then we're saying all these other voices don't matter. So mm -hmm. the canon has to be flexible. It has to be ever evolving. Yeah. And so, um, you know, if we agree to a static canon, then Alice Walker isn't in the canon. Zora Neale Hurston isn't in, a, in the canon. These are black women who are saying something different and saying something in response to sort of what the, uh, the status quo canon says. So it has to be ever evolving and, and, and beyond us. Like mm -hmm. we're 95 years old and something that's, you know, some hip hop novel that's being written today is in the canon, we might yeah. be we might have an attitude about it and say that doesn't belong in the canon, but it does because the canon has yeah. to be ever evolving as we yeah. evolve as people and as a community and as a society. In the chat, Georgia Center for the Book, and then I'm gonna to go to Chris, says challenge your teachers. Don't let them just recommend certain types of authors or certain authors ask for diversity. And I absolutely agree with that. I will often at the beginning of the semester ask my students, who do you want to be reading? Who do I? Who do you want me to teach? It doesn't mean I'm going to take all the recommendations, but I want to hear. Who am I not thinking of? Can I just say that in in some of my classes, I have a, an assignment where the students get to pick somebody to one or two works to put onto the syllabus, you know, for the end of the semester, and they present, you know, usually in teams, you know, I want we present on this one, yes. and then we add it, and so they have some agency then in, in at least a couple of the works. You know, I'm trying very hard, you know, with my reading list, but of course you've yeah. only got so much space there. Right. Um, but same. yeah, trying to get their voice in there. Same, um, I do the same thing. And Ali says that was Ali's personal comment, not speaking as the center. Um, Chris, what, do you, what is your response to this question? Yeah, I was just thinking that I mean, my situation is perhaps just a touch different in that I don't typically teach courses in literature. So the canon per se doesn't necessarily apply that often, but of course that we're doing reading every single week. Uh, we just tend to read more contemporary authors. And I guess my position has become over the last few years, and I don't, I really don't know if this, I'm not sure how it translates. I don't know that I've ever verbalized it. I might have written, written this to Josh or something, I certainly talked about it with my wife, but I, I don't, as a, I guess I feel in a creative writing workshop, a fiction workshop, like uh, as, a, as the facilitator, the teacher, yeah. Uh, the white voice, the white male voice is already well represented. And so I typically do not teach um, any white male um, writers in our 21st century. I feel like my, that voice is represented to perhaps uh, well enough and that my job is really just to go out of my way to not, to not do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But I, um, and of course, yeah, so that's just where, that's where I'm at right now anyway. I can't tell you that I was that way or, or really cognizant of that maybe five or 10 years ago. But yeah. that, that's, it's become a much more deliberate effort. And that's part of changing the canon or challenging the canon. That yeah, it is. I, I wanna just underscore what Chris is saying about reading contemporary authors. It is part of, as you're saying, Jessica, changing the canon and expanding the canon. I feel like it's important for us to read contemporary authors who are also speaking to the tumultuous times in which we live. Yeah. Um, and just for like the question that was originally put to us by Tiffany, 
you know, I would say, as James was alluding to, like, listen to what your peers are, are, are reading. I mean, you can use social media for reading lists. There's some great um, hashtags you can follow, like Diverse Books or right. Well-Read Black Girl. Uh, some organizations like that that, you know, um, really recommend really strong and important books. But also, if you have a diverse group of friends, I'm always noticing what my friends are talking about on social media and what they're reading. Mm -hmm. And they might mention a book that I haven't been aware of, and I, I will take a look at it. And especially, I like to be exposed to authors who might be outside of my purview, outside of my own um, cultural interests so that I learn about other kinds of writers. And I urge everybody to do that and, and to do that with the friends and, and peers that you respect. Right. And I would add to that, in addition to the hashtags, uh, well-read black girl and you need diverse books, follow authors on social media whose work you like um, and see who they're lifting up, right? And then that broadens the reading as well, which then can help broaden the canon. Um, here's a question. Uh, from anonymous attendee, um, J Dr. Stamet brought up the way in Ro the way Roberts is interested in liminality, and I was wondering if he or the other panelists could talk about the relationship between thinking about the liminal while also being grounded to a specific space. So, how are writers? How writers? I assume the writers were talking about here in the panel. How writers are finding that balance, what that tension offers, etc. So the balance or the friction between liminal and grounded. And this was directed at James. Well, I mean, I, I guess I could just say, you know, I, I alluded to this a little bit in my talk that, that, you know, Roberts, pretty much everything that she wrote was so grounded in one place in Kentucky. Um, so in that sense, you know, she's very invested in that place. But, you know, these characters that she's writing about sometimes exist on the margins, you know, the borders of that place. And, you know, I, I think about um, in A Buried Treasure, which, you know, I, I mentioned this ha first half, which is about this actual buried treasure. But there's a whole other half of the narrative, which follows this teenage boy who's come from a, a county to the north to do some genealogical research. And he's kind of like a rural flaneur, you know, in this space. And... And he really is on the like he's got a he's got a history in that place. His people are in the graveyard, and he's in there doing that research. And he looks like them. Like people kind of are like, oh, that must be you know this guy, but nobody knows who he is, and he's really not an, an insider. And she just brings those things into tension so well um, in lots of her books. Um, I don't know that that answers the question, but I just I think she just does a really great job. I think it's really terrific. Do either of you, Val or Chris, want to address that in terms of um, Paget Powell or Alice Walker? I'll just say real quickly that um, I'm not sure this is a totally satisfactory answer, but I do think that while I th uh, Paget gets an awful lot of credit for bringing forward the colloquial speech of uh, various parts of the South, um, that in fact, for me, the language just lifts from any anchored place and time and becomes a world and place unto itself. Um, I think there's a sense, there's moments, I mean, I wasn't reading that well. I was parched and should have had water at my side while reading passages of Paget Pal to you. But um, I, through my sticky lips, I was able to, I think, get clear to you that it's a strange reading dynamic to inhabit his sentences and his pages. And I think, um, that I don't know that that's specific to the South. I don't know that that's even really reflective of the South, but I admittedly it was in the South for two years. So someone could speak to that much more intelligently than I would. But for me anyway, in terms of liminal space, the language itself um, becomes the, the, the place in which you inhabit and try to figure out where you are and why you're lost and how you're supposed to get forward or backward or find any kind of shelter of any kind. Yeah, and I'm gonna have a follow-up question on that for you, Chris, from Josh, but I wanna to go to Val. Well, I would just say for Alice Walker, you know, much of her early fiction, short stories and, and novels is set in the American South. Um, her having grown up in rural Georgia, Eatonton, Georgia, which is about an, uh, an hour and a half away from Atlanta. Um, but even though much of her work is set in the South, 
it transcends time and place. Um, you have a, a, a novel like The Color Purple, which is a rural Southern novel, but one of the characters is um, in a um, fictional uh, country in Africa. And you have these two sisters corresponding to each other. So in that novel, which was 1982, you have that, um, you know, that kind of understanding of Pan-Africanism, of connection across continents. And then in a novel like The Temple of My Familiar, which some people criticize as being um, uh, too woo-woo, that book is, uh, it's, uh, I would say it's Afrofuturism in a way. It's early kind of, um, it's an early uh, attempt by a writer who's known as a Southern writer, but it's an early kind of um, exploration of African-American, you know, future African-Americans in the future, Afrofuturism, and also transcending uh, time, space, and even, you know, um, planets. And it's about people, um, you know, kind of seeing, having different incarnations and things like that. So a lot of people who wanted to keep Alice Walker fixed as being a Southern novelist had trouble with that book because it took us to different places. And I think that is um, just one of the beauties of her, her work uh, as a writer. So being, you know, grounded, but being transcendent. And also, you know, um, August Wilson, the great uh, American playwright, once said that for African Americans, the South is our ancestral homeland. Uh, for African Americans, like we don't have a country in Africa that we can all look to and say, this is where we are from. African Americans are uh, an unusual people in that we don't have a homeland. And so August Wilson posited that the American South is the ancestral homeland of African Americans. So I think it's interesting that Alice Walker's work is rooted in the South, but goes so far beyond that. And we are, you know, there's the red clay always clinging to our feet, but we, we can go everywhere. We can be transcendent. I think that's what her work says. A um, couple more questions and then I will throw it back to Joe and Allie. Josh asks, Chris, do you find Powell hard to teach because his logic or the logic of his characters is idiosyncratic? Well, uh, I guess um, I find Paget Powell to be hard to teach because, well, I, th I find that teaching writers like Paget Powell and Paget Powell is rather challenging because uh, my readers and my writers today, let's just say my writers today in my classes don't necessarily love to be challenged in the way that uh, authors like Powell are eager to challenge. Um, this week we're reading uh, Samantha Schweblin's Mouthful of Birds. Um, last week or two weeks ago, we read uh, Nafisa Thompson Spires' uh, The Heads of the Colored People. These are challenging texts in a lot of different ways they're not on board uh, broadly, generally speaking, generically speaking. Obviously, there's some writers eager to rise up uh, and, and look up and, and uh, work to wor <laughs> work, period. Um, and, uh, but, but for right now, I think to answer the question, I don't know if it's so much about the idiosyncras idiosyncrasies of Powell's work, so much as it is just the rigor um, and I don't think that's idiosyncratic. I just think the rigor has been a real challenge in the last few years, five or so years. And I don't know what that means. I don't know what, I don't know what that is. I do feel like in the last five or so years, they've gotten less eager to work. I don't know. I feel like I'm throwing my beloved students under the bus. They're really wonderful people. I do love them. Also, they employ me, which I value. But honestly, it's, I've been surprised that so much of work like Powell's uh, is not received with a sort of um, enthusiasm for the rigor. I hope that's the right answer, or that's an answer. That has a lot to do with authorial voice. It has a lot to do with what people are accustomed to reading. And I, I dare say, I dare say, uh, that it has a lot to do with how hard it has been to be a teacher and a student this past year. Yeah, if you teaching remotely, fair. I think that you know our uh, hard drives up here are, are wearing down a little bit. 
I'm gonna go to one last question and then I'm gonna throw it back to Joe and Allie. Uh, Val Pearl asks, what does Walker think about her stories now? And do you think they were eclipsed by her Pulitzer? Um, I think uh, Alice Walker is, uh, so um, in 2019 for her 75th birthday, I helped to organize uh, AW75, which was a big birthday party for her in her hometown of Eatonton, Georgia. And as part of that event, we had, uh, we brought in short, we brought in contemporary writers to read from her work. And I invited those writers, hand selected them with input from Ms. Walker. And we asked them to just read something by her that they loved. And I gave them pretty, wide berth in terms of what they chose. And people read, uh, because it was, uh, you know, they had 15 and 20 minutes to read, people read short stories, people read excerpts from novels, people read poetry. And Alice was in the audience for that. And for her to get to hear all of this work being read back to her, work that she had written, it was, I mean, she told me later that the day was, for her, it was flawless you know, to just have that kind of experience as a way of celebrating her. Um, so I feel that she, and, and I, to answer Pearl's question, I definitely had people read from work other than The Color Purple, because I think the outsized success of The Color Purple and the Pulitzer Prize can sometimes eclipse her other work or seem to, but I don't think it does. I think her work just stands up. So like, on that whole day of celebration. I don't think anybody read from The Color Purple until that night, the last event of the evening, when I asked Alice Walker to read a short section hmm. from The Color Purple. So all day you heard Alice Walker, you know, just excerpts from her work and um, music inspired by her work and all of that. And it wasn't until the end of the day in her own voice that we heard The Color Purple. So The Color Purple is a major, um, entree into the canon of Alice Walker. Um, next year, the color purple will be celebrating its 40th anniversary. And I'm sure it's gonna be a big deal, but it's just one sliver of the amazing um, work that she has done. And so I think she knows that. And sometimes maybe it is a little frustrated when other people don't know that, but um, I think, um, it's a good, it's a good gateway drug, right? The color purple gets you in, and then you can, you can really dive into the the harder stuff. Yeah. Um, I want to thank James and Valerie and Chris uh, for a terrific conversation today that went to authors we should be reading and ways we should be thinking about who we're reading and how we're reading and good tips on how to move forward uh, into the rest of the 20th century, 21st century. Um, Jill, welcome back. I'm going to throw to you. Thank you all so much. I'm just applauding here. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you once again, James, Christopher, and Valerie for that panel. That, of course, concludes Lost Southern Voices 2021. As we look to 2022, we will plan for whatever the possibility may be, whether we're limited in person, whether we're back virtually, whether it's a model that combines both. Um, I mean, I think it's great that you dedicated your afternoon to us and let us come into your homes and bring you these wonderful presenters talking about these wonderful voices, lost, unknown, or somewhere in between. I'd also like to thank Gina and Pearl and Carrie and of course our program assistant Allie here at the Georgia Center for the Book. Don't forget we will be making those drawings for the raffles and we're getting back to you next week to let you know all of the winners. We've got a lot of things coming up on the plate thanks to this conference. It looks like we may be doing a series on Baldwin. I don't know about that Lost Southern Voices anthology. I will say from a publishing end, dead authors and public domain are way easier to anthologize than anything else. So maybe, maybe. But thank you again, everyone, for your participation, for your support. We will see you all again very, very soon. Have a wonderful afternoon.